Okay, guys, we are back for chapter seven. And chapter seven is called Raven. Here we go. All the next day I sleep, the stiff bark over my cut itches, but my tongue is too dry for licking. My leg hurts, but it will bear weight. In the cool of the night, I walk toward the smell of water as slowly as a bear walks out of its winter den. At sunrise, I see a ditch full of water ahead. The stench of cattle is thick on the ground, but I do not care. Without water, I will die. A few steps closer, and the scent of men stops me in my tracks. The scent of men stops me in my tracks. <clears throat> in the mountains, <clears throat> we found the smell of men around circles of stones and ashes. It is the smell mother taught me to fear above all others. Men are the worst of all dangers, unpredictable. Even bears, with all their seasonal moods, are easier to understand than men. I duck low in the grass and I watch. There is no sight or sound of men. I creep closer and get a, a looking smell at the prints. I am in no shape to fight or even run. But these prints have no toes, just a pad in back and another pad in front. Maybe this man cannot run either. Mother says they are fast for only having two legs, but they cannot fly like all the other two-leggers. I cannot take a risk, so I wait. Even though I am more thirsty than I ever have been, even though the sun is rising, and with its heat, and with that my thirst, still I wait and I listen. And when I am sure, completely sure, that the men are gone, I dash for water and I plunge my head in. Even with the stink of cattle, nothing in my life has ever tasted sweeter than the clear, cold water. I drink until my belly is full. I find a hidden spot and I doze all day long in the soft green grass. Mice come to the water and birds and rabbits they are all too fast for me, and by moonlight a lumbering raccoon comes to drink. In one agonizing leap, I crush it. Pain shoots up my shoulder as I eat. Okay. The next morning, I am still lying in the grass and nibbling on the bones when a single raven swoops down and lands beside me. For a long time, she regards me with her one-eyed stare. This raven is black as dirt after a fire, just like all the rest, but she has a bear patch on her chest, picked clean of feathers. I look at it carefully, and she looks at the brown bark on my chest just as carefully. What could have happened to her? She flies as well as I used to run, but why has she come to watch me so intently? I look at the bones around me. I have eaten every scrap. In my hunger, I left nothing for the vultures or the ravens or any other creature in need. Father would be ashamed of me. I sniff the skeleton, and I find a scrap of meat left on a leg bone. I nudge it toward the raven. I remember how ravens talked to my father, how they led him to food, and he thanked them with a gift of scraps. I need my pack, and maybe this raven can help me find them. I would give an entire elk to know what she can see from the air. I dip my head to her as I have seen birds do, and she dips her head in return, but does not take the meat. She circles around me, making a low, rattling call. I have seen a raven do this to an eagle that had caught a rabbit. The raven kept circling behind the eagle and pulling his tail feathers. A test. To attack the raven, the eagle would have had to let go of the rabbit. Except for wolves, nobody hunts as well as an eagle. As I watched, I waited for the eagle to strike the raven dead. But even before the eagle towered over the raven, outweighed it, had far greater reach of the wing. The eagle simply swallowed a few more bites of his kill and flew away. 
<clears throat> At the time, it gave me hope in my quest to make Sharp lower his tail to me. The largest creature doesn't always win. Daring and persistence can triumph in the end. But now the raven's game makes me nervous. What could she want from me? I have given her all the meat I have left. I get to my feet. The pain in my shoulder is less, but it feels stiff when I spin around to meet the raven face to face. She takes a few flaps backwards and circles behind me again. I spin in the other direction. It isn't so stiff on that side. I shake out my matted fur and I growl at her. She fluffs up her neck feathers and calls at me. I should have asked Father how to speak to ravens. He seemed to understand them without words. The raven takes a scrap of bone in her beak and flies away. She climbs sharply, drops the bone directly over my head, and then dives for it. Against my will, I crouch as she plummets towards me. And then, with a sharp thump of opening tail feathers, she catches the bone in her claws, pulls out the dive, and circles me with chatters of victory. A good trick. She flies off ahead of me, but in my clear sight, drops the bone and dives for it again. It is no pup's game. Ravens do things for a reason. She is talking to me. She must know where to find meat. For all their savvy, ravens have the wrong beak for opening a hide. They need someone with teeth to get at the meat. So I follow her, walking at first, but as my stiff leg loosens, I manage a slow trot. She takes me out across the prairie, away from the water. There are countless game trails, each smell distracting me. But I cannot run fast enough to take down a coyote or a deer. One of the trails has a man smell. My father never hunted elk without checking for it. We walked away from easy pickings when the scent of men was on the ground. I am happy when the raven leads me away from that path. The sun rises high in the sky and I am weary enough to stumble when I hear the sound of rushing water. I stop and listen. There is no water smell. I can only smell hay and mint and a few other things I have never smelled before. <clears throat> I pause and then lift my head, turning from side to side to make sense of what my nose tells me. We come over a rise in the ground, and before me is a green meadow with no elk or deer or any other good thing in it, only nodding rows of dark green mint stretching on it on an unnatural straight lines. Mother showed me a man's home ground once, far from far away, and it had plants in straight rows and great patches of bald earth. Men do strange things for no reason, she said. A man sat upon a noise-making thing and rode its back around and around in wide circles over the dirt. For no reason. You have to think about, what is mom talking about there? What kind of description is that? What are they describing there? There was good water to one side of him, and a deer with her fawn hiding in the dappled shade of aspen on the other side of him. He had no use for food or water. Men do much with dirt, Mother said, but they can kill with a look and a loud noise. Keep your distance. There is no understanding them. <clears throat> the plants and rows make me anxious, and I raise the fur on my shoulders to say so. But the raven coaxes me along. At least there is water in a ditch to drink. On the far side is the Black River, a raven black river, completely still, frozen in the heat of summer. The noisemakers of men go down this frozen black river faster than I can run. It smells like death. I am weary and disappointed. This is no place for a wolf. My family would never look for me here. I sit down and refuse to budge. The raven circles over my head and then swoops toward the shore of the black river and in my disgust, I ignore her. 
the raven just as stubbornly swoops from me to the shore and back again. I do not care. I am not moving a step closer. In all the shock of bad smells and loud noises, almost don't hear the coyotes. They scamper around the mint field in a yapping yellow mass. They go to the raven and, with yelps of glee, fall upon whatever she has shown them. My stomach rumbles and water runs at my mouth. I have not eaten since yesterday. I need a full belly in order to heal as I should. I stand up and I make my way toward the feeding coyotes. If they see that I'm injured, they will turn on me. But if I scare them away with a howl, I can carry off some meat. I warily circle downwind of them, and then I stand at the top of the ridge. I raise my head, and I let out my fiercest howl. The coyotes scatter as though they have been swept up by a storm. My tail rises to see them disappear. Into the tall grass beyond the farm. I turn back to claim my prize. It is small, much of it is already gone, and I am too hungry to complain. But then I see the paw. Not the broad hoof of an elk, nor the narrow one of a deer, but a paw. Five pads and four claws. What skin is left shows brown spots on white and soft, drooping ears. I turn away in disgust. I will be much hungrier than I am now before I stoop to take such leavings from a pack of wistless coyotes, witless coyotes. I turn and I walk away. As the sun lowers and the air cools, I hear a howl, and for a moment hope leaps up up in me. But it is only the bachelor wolves, just those two, and no family of mine. I ache from ears to tail, I want my pack. Still, any wolf is better than none. I turn toward their howling, and I lope away. Hmm. Okay. So that is the end of that chapter. We'll resume next time with a chapter called Found.